I have to take her from one babysitter and bring her to the other babysitter because I just can't find somebody for the whole day that's affordable. Parents are scrambling to keep up as job action continues. Almost a million students out of class today as the elementary union holds a one-day strike across the province. Chrysler unveiling major changes to their Pacifica. Could it be enough to turn things around at the Windsor Assembly Plant? A live look outside here on Windsor and what do you see? A lot of snow. Those snowflakes are falling. They're pretty big and it's pretty blustery. Doesn't look like it'll stop until tomorrow morning. It's minus two outside right now. Colette Kennedy has the full forecast tonight. I'm Chris Ensing. Thanks for joining us. It's become a more common sight at Windsor schools. Teachers walking the picket line. Classes were canceled for close to 1 million elementary students in Ontario today. As the unions and the province remain locked in a stalemate, the strikes are causing trouble for parents. As Stacey Janzer tells us, finding a place for their children to go is coming at a cost. Mom, I didn't have a good day. Where's my teachers? Where's my friends? All, all new kids again. So it's, it's, it's hard for everybody. Jill Thompson had to work today. She doesn't have family who can take care of her four-year-old daughter while teachers strike. So I'm relying on after-school programs that do during the day service. And a lot of the times if they don't get enough parents, they cancel the whole thing. Like this just happened to me this week. So today she had to juggle between two babysitters and it's taxing on both mother and daughter. Basically it's like going to school on the first day all over again. It's very stressful. You have new kids that you don't know um, and it's, it's a whole other building. So it, it's hard on all of us. Outside Westgate Public School, teachers keep warm by marching along the sidewalk. They're continuing to push the provincial government to negotiate with the union. It really is a battle for the children and the education. And as much as it is a struggle, I'm also a parent. Um, it's in the long run what is best for students and for children. As teachers push for further talks, the Minister of Education says in order to get a deal, common sense must prevail. I remain hopeful and our team is squarely focused on trying to create the incentives to get them to stay at the table and be reasonable. But the prerequisite of a deal is every party being reasonable. It doesn't look like today will be the last for strikes. All four teachers unions are currently engaged in job action and the public schools elementary union plans to walk out again next Tuesday and Wednesday. Stacey Janzer, CBC News, Windsor. Now, the province has been compensating parents for the strike, paying families for each day of school missed. Since mid-January, families can apply for between $25 and $60 a day. That's for children that are under 12. But it looks like some may have been overpaid. Several parents saw four days' worth of compensation put into their accounts on Monday, even though at that point, elementary teachers had only been on strike at their boards for one day. The government says it was a computer error and that only a small number of parents were affected. The Ambassador Bridge is one of the busiest international crossings in North America, but last month someone slipped through security, escaping Border Patrol officers. A 31-year-old man entering the States stopped for the initial screening, and then a Customs and Border Protection officer told them to go to secondary screening. Instead, the man busted through the toll booth, passed secondary, and raced in his vehicle onto the freeway. Nine days later, he was arrested in Ohio on separate charges. He's now in the custody of the U.S. Marshals. Officials say he, quote, will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Human remains have been found at Point Pelee National Park. The CBC's Sanjay Maru has details on the challenges of identifying these remains. It was about 36 hours ago as crews were working to install a new hydro line here at Point Pelee National Park when they made a startling discovery. That discovery right here, now covered under a blue tarp. But at that time, they found what they believe to be skeletal remains. Now, OPP saying they suspect those remains are human. The area has been secured. Work to install that new hydro line is continuing, except for, of course, in this specific area. Work here, of course, has been paused as police investigate the suspected human remains. OPP today saying they're going to work with the region's coroner's office and a forensic anthropologist during this investigation. 
all we know is that it's found human bones. We don't know how many. We don't know which bones. And we don't know how complete they are. So it's possible that you could just find uh, pieces of bone, and you can say that they're human, but there might not be enough of the bone to say, um, to assess age or to assess uh, sex. Holland adds one of the more important distinctions to make when analyzing these bones, determining how old they are. Police may work with First Nations groups to ensure they're repatriated appropriately, but if the remains are more recent, however, Holland says signs of trauma will be analyzed to find out what happened to the person or people behind the bones. Sanjay Maru, CBC News, Leamington. Some breaking news just coming into our newsroom. There's two new presumptive cases of the coronavirus in British Columbia. Officials making that announcement just moments ago. Meanwhile, back here in our city, Windsor Regional Hospitals Board is meeting at this hour. A spokesperson confirmed today to CBC News that it has tested a number of people for the coronavirus. They wouldn't give an exact number, but it's less than 10, says a spokesperson. There are still no confirmed cases here in our community. Ontario public health officials gave an update this morning. We've already shown a remarkably responsive to the 2019 novel coronavirus. The system is working, continues to work. Officials say risk to the public remains low, and all three cases of the virus previously confirmed in this province are recovering well. They say 62 people are currently being tested and are in self-isolation, either at home or in a hospital. They won't be released from isolation until they receive two negative tests. Meanwhile, two Canadian passengers from a ship under quarantine in Japan are now ashore. Now, they're among a second group of passengers who have tested positive for the coronavirus. 249 other Canadians still on that cruise ship. CBC News has spoken to some of them, and they tell us that they're getting most of their information from media reports. We have um, uh, little communications uh, with the ship. The captain has made two announcements today. Um, so, you know, the first one, he updated us about the 10 more cases. And then the second one was telling us that he uh, got permission to let some of the um, passengers out uh, to walk about on the seventh floor um, walkway. You're looking at video taken by some American passengers aboard the Diamond Princess. And it shows those two Canadians and eight other passengers being taken off the ship. Now, they'll undergo a second test to confirm the infection. Ten other presumptive cases from the ship were taken to hospital yesterday. And there are also Canadians on board another quarantined cruise ship. The World Dream is docked in Hong Kong. The shipping company tells CBC News that there are 36 Canadians among the 3,600 people on the ship. Passengers and crew will be quarantined until they are checked for the virus. And that includes more than 30 crew members who now have symptoms such as fever, cough or a sore throat. It's been less than a week since the downtown mission pulled the plug on the chat and text service at their distress center, which provides emotional support for people who are experiencing a crisis. There's still a provincial service, but one volunteer here in Windsor says every bit helps. We have a rapport with people, people know they're talking to us, and, and, I, and I feel terrible. Last Thursday I told someone to message back in next week and I would be here for her and, and I'm not there. And that, that's heartbreaking to me. So I, the last thing I would want to hope is that someone gets triggered because, because we don't have the funding to operate and, and, and do something that they can't take back. The provincial service says wait times have increased from five minutes to an hour. People have been complaining about this. Now that volunteer says that she's working with other volunteers, brainstorming ways to fundraise money so that the service can return, adding that young people are being affected the most. Distress Centre Ontario gets about 30,000 text and chat messages a year across Ontario. In Ottawa, senators are hoping to fast-track a bill aimed at ensuring mental health support for jurors trauma traumatized by the details of difficult crimes. The bill revives an earlier initiative in the House of Commons that ran out of time to amend the criminal code. These experiences 
stay with you for the rest of your life. When you, you face trials uh, like the Victoria Stafford or the Bernardo case or uh, all, these cases are much, much, much more difficult and but anyone can suffer from PTSD. Now, as it stands, the criminal code bars former jurors from ever discussing what went on during jury deliberations, even with mental health professionals. Many former jurors report lasting distress from what they hear and see in some of the trials that they have nowhere now to turn to for their fears or anxiety. The Senate bill would change that. The senators believe that this bill has wide support and could pass through the Senate by spring with adoption by the Commons this summer. A day after his impeachment acquittal, Donald Trump lashed out at those who had tried to remove him from office. He made his comments at the National Prayer Breakfast and then at the White House. CBC's Katie Simpson has more word of warning. This report contains some strong language. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. The National Prayer Breakfast in Washington is a nonpartisan event where political opponents come together to find common ground, even if for just a moment. But the president today made it all about himself. As everybody knows, my family, our great country, and your president have been put through a terrible ordeal by some very dishonest and corrupt people. That shot was aimed at House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who sat meters away from Donald Trump during his address. He then ripped into Senator Mitt Romney, the only Republican who voted to convict him at his impeachment trial. I don't like people who use their faith as justification for doing what they know is wrong. What do you say? There's some people who use faith as an excuse to do the wrong things. You remember what he said about Romney? You got that there? What a, what, it was so inappropriate at a prayer breakfast. Trump embraced his anger when he gathered supporters, including his impeachment lawyers, for a celebration of his acquittal and accomplishments at the White House, using strong language to make his point. We've been going through this now for over three years. Uh, it was evil, it was corrupt, it was dirty cops, uh, it was leakers and liars. And this should never, ever happen to another president, ever. It was all bullshit. Trump's comments went on like that for more than an hour. The off-the-cuff speech highlighted the single point that he is not willing to forgive and forget. This acquittal appears to have energized the president as he ramps up his re-election efforts. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. A CP rail train moving crude oil jumped the tracks early this morning in south-central Saskatchewan, sparking a fire that filled the air with greasy black smoke. There were no casualties. A speed restriction will require them to go at no more than 25 miles an hour uh, across the country, except there is a limitation of 20 miles per hour in built-up metropolitan areas. This was the scene just after it occurred before sunrise today. The train had 104 cars, all told 31 derailed. The 2021 Chrysler Pacifica will have a bit of a refresh. FCA unveiled the new model at the Chicago Auto Show. You're taking a look at the new version of the Windsor built minivan. Now you can tell they're focused on safety here. There's a lot of features to help people drive. They're touting a new class leading all wheel drive capability. If wheels lose traction on ice or snow, the vehicle actually knows to transfer engine torque to the wheels with more traction. I saw a couple drivers outside who could use that today. There's a bit of a new look as well if you look closely. And there's also a new Connect 5 system. So you're adding a touchscreen built in Alexa services and it's supposed to be faster too. Well, it brings the minivan up into the modern times. It allows it to compete better with crossovers. Uh, the new all-wheel drive system provides the added traction that everybody's looking for when they buy a crossover. So it gives a potential for more buyers moving into the minivan field. More buyers could help the third shift at the Windsor assembly plant. About a year ago, FCA said it would be shutting down that shift because of slumping Pacifica sales. They've pushed that back multiple times. Now at this point, it's been extended until the end of March. 
No price released on this 2021 model, but the automaker hopes to have it on a dealership lot near you before the end of the year. Take a live look outside there. The road's relatively clear despite the snowflakes that are falling down outside. We will ask Colette how much we're going to have to shovel out of tomorrow morning after the break. Google says it's on a search to fill jobs in Canada. The company plans to expand its presence here, adding positions in three cities. Two are in Ontario. Jacqueline Hansen has the details. In Google's search for tech talent, it keeps coming up Canada. We're excited about what we're seeing um, and, and leaning heavily into it. At Google Canada's headquarters, the tech giant announced that over the next two years, it will build three new offices in Waterloo, Toronto and Montreal for work on cloud security and gaming development, as well as sales, marketing and AI research. There's extraordinary momentum, extraordinary talent, and we're really excited and humbled to be part of it. Google currently has about 1,500 employees in Canada. More office space like this means it could hire as many as 3,500 more. But Google isn't the only company to see potential in Canada's tech sector. It's getting more competitive for talent. Toronto is North America's fastest growing tech market and other smaller markets are trying to catch up. Calgary recently launched a $4 million ad campaign to try to attract more tech workers. This place is Calgary, Alberta. 
a future-proof city, diverse in culture and diverse in economy. There's concern, though, that some companies could be held back if there aren't enough people to fill jobs. It used to be that technical com tech companies would hire tech talent. And of course, now everyone is the banks, the manufacturing companies, you know, government. As part of Google's event today, it announced efforts to help build the pipeline with tech talent. It's giving a grant of two and a half million dollars to Empower Canada, a charitable organization that supports underserved young adults. An investment that benefits Canada, but could also pay off for the company in the future. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. And joining us now for a live look at the weather is Colette Kennedy. Now, Colette, there's snowflakes falling outside. Uh, our friend Jason is outside. He's covering a story. But if there is anybody in our office who loves tweeting out videos, and he's always at you, showing these beautiful images. <laughs> yes, he is. What's up with that guy? He gets so excited, <laughs> but he never helps clean any of the cars off when we start oh, our Oh, is that right? It's difficult. Yeah, that should That's be tough. a condition. You, you cannot post any more snow videos, Jason, right? until you do some work. A little shoveling maybe, too. Those are the rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just going to set those rules. Heck with it. Uh, let me tell you, the snow, yeah, we've been seeing several hours of what's being reported as light snow. And, you know, you're feeling it. We did have a little bit of freezing rain late this morning mixed in there as well. There's still more to come, but because the intensity isn't too strong, we're not going to see a significant amount in accumulations. But there will be some more coming in. I'm going to show you on the radar so you can see just how deep this is in terms of what's still going to make its way through. Minus three though, that's our current temperature. Minus eight is how it feels. It feels like minus double digits though, minus 11 there, that wind chill for Chatham-Kent. And this is what I mean about the depth of this system of what's to come. In fact, let's broaden that and you can see there is an end to it, right back to the west, to the south, getting into drier areas. This is what has to work its way through southwestern Ontario. So this evening, even overnight into tomorrow morning, we're still going to be, although it'll get spottier at times and lighter in nature, we're still going to be dealing with this probably for the morning commute. I would expect we're going to see maybe another two to four centimeters in here. And locally, a few spots could see as much as five. But in general, we'll be on the lighter end of that. So it's kind of a battle here. The moisture with the system to the south of us, this high pressure and cold front that wants to come through and not really making haste because they're kind of pushing back on each other. Eventually this front is going to drop in, but in the meantime we get that precipitation and then kind of drops off and then fills back in. So that's tomorrow morning. Finally that front moves through. Those winds will be quite strong, kind of turning towards the northwest and they'll be a little bit gusty for a while and then they'll start to ease off later in the day on Friday. And we should get maybe even a little bit of clearing too. So getting some sunshine as the day wears on. That high pressure does get in here starting to come in as we go into Saturday but we're still going to be seeing some residual cloud cover and in fact into Sunday another system is pushing towards us as it does into the afternoon we'll probably start to see some flurries then a little bit of light snow and a mix kind of coming through Sunday night into Monday morning so a few more centimeters possible there but because of the mix it'll probably be just a little bit slushy your temperatures tonight minus three but the wind chill minus eight We'll come up just a couple of degrees tomorrow, late day, hopefully getting into a little bit of sunshine, but those winds strong, so making it feel cooler. And then speaking of cool air, kind of chilly Friday night into Saturday and Saturday night into Sunday. But that next system, at least, Chris, when it comes through, it'll pull the temperatures up a little bit with it. When the temperatures go up, that's what I'm going to make up for what I just said about Jason and probably help him by shoveling out his driveway or something like that. As long as it's not cold, I gotta, I'm, I'm willing to be part of the team. That's, uh, I knew you were a team player. Yeah, we're trying here. Thanks I don't want to help, though, if that's okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I will. I love that. I, lo I know. You're, you're one of us. We, we love you. We love you. <laughs> Oh man, uh, take a look at this. I want this horse on our team. I feel like every once in a while it'd be fun to go cover a story from that angle, right? Just on top, John Ryan sent this photo in. Absolutely beautiful as always. And it is our weather photo of the day. If you have one in the Windsor Essex area, just pop it over to us through our Facebook page. You can post on our wall. You can also email us, windsor at cbc.ca. You can also tag us on Instagram or Twitter at CBC Windsor for both of those. An accessible sports league is looking for volunteers and coming up we'll tell you how you might be able to help out.
The accessible Miracle Field baseball diamond is almost ready, and the home league is recruiting not just players, but volunteers too. The main volunteer that we need is a buddy. A buddy is going to team up with our players to help them play the game of baseball. So sometimes they can't run the bases so well or catch a ball, and sometimes they need a little protection. So the buddy's going to enable that player to have all that. The diamond has rubberized surface, so it's wheelchair accessible, and it's expected to open by the end of May. A special web series on cbc.ca is dedicated to telling stories of being black in Canada. One of the voices that you can hear on there is Masai Ujiri, the grand architect behind the Toronto Raptors NBA championship last year. Take a look. Uh, and the second thing that came to me was Africa won, you know, uh, Canada won. You know, like we prove to people that you ain't have to, you don't have to come from a certain place uh, to win. Now that interview and other stories are at www.cbc.ca slash being black in Canada. An Australian reporter draped a python around her shoulders while doing a story on snake safety. But the reptile wasn't as cooperative as she hoped. <laughs> the python, you saw it there, just attacked the microphone. But the reporter stuck through it with help from the cameraman and the snake handler as well. After the snake calmed down, she was able to get the footage that she needed for her story. The only python that you will ever see me interview is that one right there. 6.29 p.m., thanks for watching. Make sure you have yourself a wonderful evening.